This is what you do when you've just found that statement handbag on eBay and you want to build an entire wardrobe around it. You start selling to keep buying. Yep, on eBay. Over that all black everything phase, list it and buy all the color. Feeling more vintage than ever? It's out with the new and in with the pre-loved. Next thing you know, you've refreshed your wardrobe basically without spending a dime. Yeah, eBay, the place to buy and sell new, pre-loved, vintage, and rare fashion. As dawn broke over the seven seas, the pirates of the Crimson Galleon set sail for adventure. But there was one problem. Paperwork. Mountains of it. Filing, invoices, you name it. <sighs> this is where I can't fit for a pirate. Luckily, their captain had an idea. She used the smart buying tools on Amazon Business so they could work more efficiently and get back to doing what they do best. I know, right? Amazon Business, your partner for smart business buying. Hello and welcome to The Price of Football, the show that looks at the money Behind the Beautiful Game with me, Kevin Day, and Liverpool University's Kieran Maguire. I'm not going to lie to you, Kieran. It's Tuesday night. It's it's quarter past nine. I've, I've done this pod feeling rough before when we've done it at quarter past nine in the morning. Normally my fault, but I'm just back from the first leg of the 63-mile walk, 22 miles so. I'm feeling a little bit stiff, Kieran. I'm gonna I'm gonna admit the magic. to feeling a little bit stiff. I've, I've had a hot bath, I may have a cold bath, I've had several protein drinks. I'll probably fall asleep doing MasterChef Australia, but <laughs> I, I've just calmed down after a slight panic. This was a, I got ready to get in the bath and I thought, oh my god, I, I've lost half my little toe. This huge chunk of skin's come off my little toe. Oh no. And it was a it was a sticking plaster I forgot I'd put on this morning. So, <laughs> so, so I was like literally, Ed, yeah, call nine nine nine. My little toe's gone missing. It'll be a plaster dead. Otherwise, all good, Kieran, how are you? I'm fine, but I'm not walking 62 miles. Well, having said that, you did a marathon of your own. This is, I don't think there was a local radio station you weren't on yesterday. It was a personal best. I managed to do yeah, 21 yeah. interviews in a single day. Yeah, I, I, I got interviewed by BBC Radio Surrey this morning before the start, and I, I channeled my inner Maguire. I thought, this is what it's like to be Kieran Maguire. <laughs> Quarter past eight in the morning, I'm talking to Radio Surrey. Not only that, Kieran, but we recorded the pod yesterday. I went down to have a haircut. And lo and behold, you're on the telly in the barbers on Sky. I tried to explain to the barber, but there was a, uh, a communication problem. But or he doesn't listen to the pod. I don't know. But good grief! It's Newsday, Kieran, and we've got some of those stories that we we hinted at to talk about. It's it's big news this week. So let's crack on. The first story involves referees, Kieran, and we've you know. It's been a season of controversy for referees um, and some bad news for them off the pitch. Yes, um, this is a Supreme Court ruling. Uh, There has been a case that's been rumbling on for 18 months. And this is in respect of not all referees, but those referees who are doing matches effectively on an an on-call basis as to whether they should be treated as employees or self-employed. And the Supreme Court ruled 5-0 in favour of HMRC that these referees should be treated as members of staff by PGMOL, and therefore they should have national insurance and POE effectively deducted at source. So this could result in a, in a fairly hefty bill for PGMOL. At the same time, the Supreme Court has said, but we're not sure, whilst we've voted 5-0 in favour, we're not sure that we got it right. So it's been sort of kicked upstairs to something called a first tier tribunal. And without wanting to get too bogged down in the intricacies of tax law, it just shows what a mess the system is. And this is for anybody that is freelance or quasi-freelance. Yeah, yeah. They do things in good faith. They will take advice from their accountants. They will pay tax on that basis. And then HMRC turn around and says, well, we interpret the rules in a different manner. Things are overly complex. As somebody that used to teach tax, albeit many years ago, because before I went into sort of football finance, I gave up because each year you'd, you'd start off with a a set of tax rules which were 
hundreds, if not thousands of pages long. And then the chancellor would come along once a year and come up with a wacky ruse, which would rule out some of them and introduce them. So it's, it's impossible to keep up. So I do have an ele- element of sympathy here with the referees. It all revolves around two issues. First of all, something called mutuality of obligations, Ooh, right. which, which sounds like sort of the tricky third album from a prog rock <laughs> band. <laughs> and that sort of, it says, does PGMOL provide work and is payment being made? And the answer to those two questions was yes. yes yeah. Does PGMO control the situation? Well, yeah, because they appoint the referees. So we wait to see. This doesn't apply to the likes of you know, Anthony Taylor and, and the other sort of senior referees who are on a full-time contract. They are full-time uh, employees. Oh, it's okay. sort of more those referees that, that come in and people say, well, hold on. Yeah, we, we see the same bunch of referees in the Premier League every week. That is the case. But that's not the case as you drop down through the divisions and you look at the WSL as well. They, they, they tend to have a, they have some who are guaranteed matches every week and then they have some who sort of come in and out. As you know from doing freelance work yourself, you, you hand across your affairs to your accountant yeah, in yeah. that good faith. And I think it's unfortunate that these people have now got a nasty shock and they might have to go and pay more tax as a result. So we can't argue that Premier League referees, one of the reasons they've been making dodgy decisions this season is they've had half an eye on this tribunal coming up and they've been worried about it. So we're talking about, you're talking about referees then who in true freelance way have been supplying their services and invoicing for each individual occasion. That's correct, yes. So they're they're not being considered as freelance by this tribunal, by the Supreme Court? It looks like it. Um, Okay, right. And that does seem a bit strange because if that referee pulls a hamstring during the week whilst they're in training, and um, despite what many fans might believe, referees do an awful lot of physical activity because you've got to keep up to, to speed as far as the job is concerned. So if you pull a hamstring during the week, you don't get paid. You know, effectively, you, you phone up PGMOL and say, sorry, you know, I'm, I'm knackered, I can't do the match. They say, fine, we'll get somebody else in. So it's messy and it's not over and we're not a party political show, but you would hope that any government, yeah. including this one, would just streamline things to make things more understandable. There's an awful lot of wasted time from, first of all, the freelancer's point of view, second, that you've got the accountant, second, that you've third, you've got HMRC, all having to go through ridiculously thick rule books. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't even speculate on how much this might cost referees in, in terms of back tax, for want of a better word, because the PGMOL, possibly understandably, are incredibly, incredibly secretive about how much referees are paid at every level. So but like every freelance person who's suddenly hit with the possibility of a, having to pay extra tax, it's an incredibly stressful time for them, obviously. It is. Part of the reason why I do a full-time job is that I just don't want that uncertainty. Sure, sure. I could earn far more money as a freelance lecturer than I could by just being at the university. I happen to believe passionately in higher education, but you know, I, I've been offered work elsewhere. And I go, well, if I did that for... You know, 60 or 80 days a year, I'd, I'd earn more money than I'm picking up at the university. But it's no, it's no guarantee what happens if I'm ill and so on. So I, I've, I've gone for the, for the safe option. It's because I just don't fancy the hassle. Everton, Kieran, we've reached the stage where people, when you put out your little menu before every pod, people go, hang on a second, you haven't you forgotten Everton? We've had two developments this week, both involving billionaires. And the first happened last Friday, a fairly extraordinary statement from Everton, saying we have a, a lovely relationship with John Texter, but our version of what could be happening is different to the one he's telling everybody. And secondly, another billionaire has rethrown his hat into the ring, if you can rethrow your hat into the ring. but <laughs> So let, let's perhaps let's start with the John Texter statement first and then move on to the other US billionaire who still sounds to me like somebody who had a one-off hit in the 1970s, but we'll reach that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... You're a cool cat. This has probably never, ever happened to you. But have you ever been in a situation where you think that you're going out? You think that you're dating somebody? <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. 
<laughs> and they don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, she's my girlfriend. She's fit. Oh, yeah, she's my yeah, girlfriend. Yeah. No, no. Okay, well, but, 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 you know, we, I, I phoned you and... Uh, no, 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 no. Kevin, remember that, remember that Polish girl I told you about a couple of weeks ago? That oh, my, yeah. My Polish mate taught me what I thought was a romantic expression. <laughs> I was in exactly that same situation. I thought we were going out, but particularly after I accidentally said what I said to her, turns out we weren't, but... Uh, that didn't filter through to my my consciousness for quite some time. Uh, yeah, I think we're in a similar position to that with with John Texter. Yeah, strange. He is he is talking as if there's just one minor issue. It's a bit like when you start going out and, and somebody and you, you forget to you forget to tell them that you're already married. <laughs> um, in, in effect, that one I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, in the sense that he he does own forty five percent of Crystal Palace. Um, he's talking as if those shares have already been sold. Although my understanding, and, and you'll be much closer to this than I am, I would imagine that Steve Parish and uh, Donner and Blitzen, or whatever they're called, <laughs> have first refusal on Texter's existing shares. If not, then he would be in a position to sell them to another third party. But that has not yet happened. If it is going to be another third party, then that would have to go through the Premier League's owners and directors test, of which they are uh, very, very cautious and and understandably so, and they're giving an an important part of the Premier League to somebody else. So there's that on the sell side. And then sort of on the buy side in relation to Everton, and you've got to give credit once again to our very good friend Matt Slater here in, in terms of his investigations. Texter is saying that he's going to do two things. First of all, he's going to list Eagle Football Holdings, which is his sort of control company. He's going to list that, by the looks of it, in New York on the stock exchange. And that will have Botafogo, Vago, Lyon, uh, Molenbeek in Belgium, and at present also Palace. So, you know, he's saying, saying, if you want to, I'm going to, make these shares available to new punters, to in people that want to invest. And the advantage of having the multi-club ownership model is that if one of those clubs get relegated, well, you've got three that aren't getting relegated. So it reduces risk. Investors don't like risk and so on. And, and then mysteriously saying, you know, but Everton aren't going to be added to that list. And you go, well, surely Everton would replace Palace. And you go, no. And you go, well, well, okay, why? And it turns out that, by all accounts, he's sounded out investors and they say, we're a bit worried about Everton. First of all, £600 million worth of existing loans. What on earth is happening there? Secondly, there's the uh, sort of the the shadow of 777 in the the background. And could that be deemed to be a a proceeds of crime criminal case with repercussions for whoever owns Everton? So he's now saying, ah, well, in which case, I'm going to buy Everton myself. And people go, exactly how much money do you have, John? And he said, oh, I've, I've been talking been talking to to business partners, one of which is called Alia Capital, who are ridiculously wealthy. You know, they are they are seriously wealthy. But why would they be interested in buying Everton? It turns out that he's met somebody from Alia Partners when he was in Brazil. And again, you know, perhaps is he thinking that this is a relationship but there isn't a relationship? So I wouldn't even say it's two steps forwards and one step back. It's one step forward and one step back with regards to Texter. So that's the position there. And remember, he is now the fifth person to have entered a period of exclusivity with Farhad Mashiri, the current Everton owner, who, in my view, is is seriously letting down the fan base. You never hear from him. He's looking purely after his own self-interest. He's he's trying to cream off as much as he can from the sale of the club, not taking the club's long-term security and strategies in, into consideration. And and then as you uh, as you rightly made reference to, throwing his hat back into the room, he's back from the dead. And I think we said this at the time in respect of Friedkin and the Friedkin group. They pulled out for the reasons which we gave above in relation to 777, but they did exactly the same when they acquired Roma 
two or three years ago, dipped their toe in the water, didn't like what they saw, and then came back a few months later. So a bit like Freddy Krueger, I think we said at the time, they're not quite dead. They're never dead. <laughs> yeah. And it now appears that they are interested, but if John Texter has a period of exclusivity, when does that end? And therefore, when can Friedkin start to potentially get involved again? Or could Texter just say, I'm not going to go for Everton and effectively try to buy himself out of his exclusivity period? Texter seemed so confident in his ability to buy Everton that he was speculating on who the manager would be when he took over, which is what I think prompted Everton quite rightly to release that statement to say you've Mm. got no right to make this sort of public speculation because we are in discussions with you but it's gone no further than that just as an aside though i don't think steve parish could afford himself to buy out texter on his own were harrison blitzer to buy him out and they go from being 40 percent owners to complete owners would there then have to be a separate owner even though they're already part owners would there then be an owners and directors test Anyway, now that they become full owners, so to speak, or would they just assume that it must be legit because it's an internal takeover, so to speak? I think it's okay in its current position. And the reason for that is that the owners and directors test kicks in when you've got 30%. And I think they, they've got that oh, between okay. them. Right. So, so, right. so therefore, really, yeah. okay. that threshold has already been passed. They've already passed the relevant investigation. So it wouldn't need a reset I guess what would need a reset is the nature of the relationship between what would then could be three owners at Palace. At present, I think when it comes to decision making, it's one person, one vote, as opposed to the number of shares. Yeah, yeah. Well, Harris and Blitzer have pretty much left Steve Harris to run the club anyway, which is another complication. Now, this next story, Kieran, I'm not suggesting, because we're not cynical, I'm not suggesting that Manchester United did this deliberately. I'm not suggesting that they didn't, because I know they've been a bit humpty about some of our criticism recently. And I know, I know, I think it's fair to say that sometimes, Kieran, your relationship with Manchester United is volatile. But <laughs> just, just literally minutes after we finished recording our last news episode, Man United released their latest full year accounts. What did they have to show us? They did. And, and to be fair to Manchester United, and uh, yeah, without going into details, I've had the bollocking of all bollockings from Manchester United <laughs> recently. <laughs> Something which I did in good faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, all, we all make mistakes from time to time again. We delete they, them, we move on. We delete them <laughs> and we move on, absolutely. <laughs> and they did pre-announce when these results were going to come out. So, so therefore, I, I knew exactly when it was going to happen. So Manchester United have published their 2024 accounts. The reason why they've published them so quickly is because they're a listed company in the New York Stock Exchange, and therefore the obligation to get data out is that much more demanding, whereas clubs here in the UK, they've got nine months in which to publish their accounts, so we probably won't see the majority of them until next spring. The good news, as far as Manchester United was concerned, record revenues, £662 million. The wage bill went up a lot faster than the revenue in terms of percentage time terms. Part of the reason why the wage bill went up was down to the the redundancy programme. And I went into the redundancy programme. And as you know, I've, I've fallen out with a section of the Manchester United fan base because in my view, I've got dozens of reasons why I think the Glazers have been poor owners of Manchester yeah, United. Yeah, yeah self-interest, the the loans and so on. Creating jobs in Manchester has not been one of the things that I've levelled at the Glazers. You know, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. But clearly, Offshore Jim and his Merry Buglers uh, think differently. So there have been 250 people who have lost their job, who have been made redundant. I'm not to go into any details. I have former staff members of Manchester United contacting me through various messaging systems, you know, LinkedIn, direct messages on Twitter and so on to say, can you help me with this? Can you help me understand this? And I go, go oh, I can, but you know, I'm, I'm not HR. I will help anybody in terms of, you know, can you, can, do I know any contacts with it with other clubs and so on? That's depressing that there doesn't appear to have been any attempt to, to assist these people who decided to get a job at Manchester United, 
the chances are they love the club, you know, because it would be a dream job, I think, for many people. If you take a look at the total costs of redundancy, in 2022, Manchester United sacked Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. He and his entourage left. Ralph Ranick came in. He only lasted to the end of the season. My understanding was he didn't have much, much further of a contract. He didn't get a big payoff. Ed Woodward and co., they all left. The total cost of redundancies in 2022 for senior management and, and a few coaches was £24 million. The total cost of the redundancies in 2024 comes out as 12.2 million. So it's half. And yet it's 250 people as opposed to, you know, probably 15 to 20. And then when I delve further, it turns out that of that 12 million pounds in redundancy, 5.7 million of that went to executives, i.e. Richard Arnold left, as did one or two others. So, you know, you've got three people sharing half the money with 247 people sharing the other half. And this is what I don't like about corporate greed. Richard Arnold was handsomely remunerated. If I was him, I I would have grabbed every single penny from Manchester United that I could. So I don't blame him for that. But I think it is indicative that there were not generous payments to the other members of staff who have left, who are now trying to find work in a yeah, well, he's not an easy job market. Um, just to clarify, Kieran, th- these are, these accounts presumably would predate any Jim Ratcliffe involvement at all, wouldn't they? They're... No, no, they, they are to the year ended, the 30th of June, oh. 2024. Oh, okay, right. So, and, and that brings us to another quite important issue. If you take a look at the losses made by Manchester United over the course of the last three years, those losses are £313 million. And people are going, well, hold on, under PSR, you can only lose one hundred and five. Yeah, That's quite a big gap. That's that's more than Everton lost in that three years. And Everton, as we know, ended up with a points deduction. So you, you then go into things a little bit further. In season 21, 22, and, and this has caused quite a lot of angst and anger uh, amongst various sections of various fan bases, Manchester United claimed £40 million in COVID allowances. And people said, well, hold on, you know, COVID had finished by the summer of 2021. Manchester United are effectively saying, well, we have uh, mega stores in China. There were still very, you know, still quite significant lockdowns as far as China was concerned. We were planning an overseas tour that summer. That didn't take place. We had one of our one of our sponsors went bust on the back of COVID and we're claiming for that. And Everton fans have said, well, you know, people go bust. Tough. Because they, they had to suck it up and see yeah. uh, in, in terms of the loss of money from Alicia Usmanov the sponsor of of Everton yeah. uh, and the Premier League said yeah tough yeah wars happen you, you should you shouldn't predict it and Everton yeah you know, and I think it's it's very difficult to have sympathy with the Premier League taking that particular view nobody could have predicted the war in my view although you know as much as I loathe Putin so there was there's that which has helped to get that 313 million pounds down and then the other issue was the takeover or the part investment by Jim Ratcliffe and his Isle of Man-based company into uh, Cayman Islands registered Manchester United, that cost £35 million. And that looks as if it potentially might be included in the PSR calculations as an adjustment. And I've looked at the rules and people far smarter than I have have looked at the rules and they're going, well, we can't see where it says it, you know. And anyway, why didn't the Glazers pay for that? You know, they they were selling part of the club to to Jim Ratcliffe, but that's that's where it's gone. So we wait to see whether Manchester United have complied with the rules. My view is that, given that they weren't actively trying to sell players just before the thirtieth of June. They must be reasonably confident. You know, they would have presumably had contact with the Premier League to get some form of clarification. I think the Premier League doesn't help itself at times. It could simply come out and say, in terms of such transactions, these are deemed to be allowable, these are not deemed to be allowed. At present, nobody knows. 
And that, of course, creates speculation. And given the nature of tribalism of football fans and social media, that creates a, yeah, an absolute stink, which, uh, yeah, and I fully understand those people that say, well, just, just avoid social media. This is what you do when you've just found that statement handbag on eBay and you want to build an entire wardrobe around it. You start selling to keep buying. Yep, on eBay. Over that all black everything phase, list it and buy all the color. Feeling more vintage than ever? It's out with the new and in with the pre-loved. Next thing you know, you've refreshed your wardrobe basically without spending a dime. Yeah, eBay, the place to buy and sell new pre-loved vintage and rare fashion. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride or die stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. Another story we held over from last week, Kieran, and it's strange, you can never predict or second guess how big the media will go on a particular story. As I thought this story was bigger than, for example, the the made-up nonsense about UEFA throwing England out of their own Euros. But this story is about a country that won't host any matches now at uh, Euros, and, it, and no one seems to have paid any attention to it at all. In it, but I think this is a massive deal. It, it is. This, this is in relation to Northern Ireland. We are having somebody from the Northern Irish FA on the show in a couple of weeks, so we'll be able to discuss that in more depth. Northern Ireland were due to host some matches at a new purpose-built stadium, because Windsor Park's not big enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it doesn't satisfy the de minimis requirements that are set by UEFA. So the intention was to build a new stadium at somewhere called Casement Park. Originally, the cost was going to be £180 million. The government's just done a review and has now been said, now been told that actually it's not £180 million, it's four hundred million. Wow! Okay. So they go right. We're not going to go ahead of it. First of all, on a cost basis. Secondly, even if we did give approval now, we're not convinced that it would be finished for the Euros in twenty twenty eight, and you would have a bit of a white elephant. My understanding from listening to one or two people who know far more about this thing than I do, that there were a few other issues which are perhaps local to Northern Ireland, right. which had to be smoothed out as well. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a part of the British Isles where people can fall out quite easily, shall we say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the funding, though, this is central UK funding has been withdrawn, is it? That's right. It, it, ultimately, it was a decision which would have been made by London. Right, um, okay. rather than a devolved decision. I, right, I don't okay. think that part right. of the budget would be devolved to Stormont. Well, it, it will be really interesting when we talk to our man from the Northern Ireland FA to, again, it'd be nice if we had some good news to talk to him about. But there you go. And speaking of which, Kieran, <laughs> it's been a while since we mentioned Reading. The last time we did, we were quite chipper. And that, that's gone backwards a little bit. It has, yeah. I, I've been going on Radio Berkshire quite often. Get you. In, yeah, exactly. <laughs> living, living the dream, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and, and each time I go on, I say, you know, the latest I've heard, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I reckon by this Friday, I keep getting told X, Y, and Z. Yeah, they, uh, by this Friday, it'll be it'll be all signed, sealed, delivered, and the horrible reign of Dayonga will have ended. The bad news is that he's still there, and. Things seem to have cooled. Now, cooled isn't isn't the same as cooling it off. Between Dai Yonga and Rob Kuhig, Rob is the former owner of Wickham Wanderers. He sold his interests about six months ago, I think, to somebody from Kazakhstan. By all accounts, he has lent money to 
Reading Football Club to to help them uh, over the course of the summer. They've also substantially benefited from Crystal Palace selling Michael Elise to Bayern Munich. Yeah, I think they had a ten percent sell-on clause that would yeah. be worth another five to six million. I think Rob Kuhick's supposed to be in for around about five million himself. So. They have had enough cash to pay the bills because their women's team was effectively closed down because they decided they weren't going to pay the wages there and so on. The reason why the deal has stalled, for want of a better phrase, is unknown. In my experience, and my experience is very limited to to when I used to work for a firm of administrators many, many years ago, things just come down to price. Yeah. Yeah, Uh, Okay, right. And yeah, some people have a habit of right at the very last minute trying to get a little bit extra or to sell a little bit less and so on. And I, I don't like those type of negotiations. But we, we did have Rob Kuhig on, on the show you know, two or three years ago. He did, yeah. he's, a, he's, he's a tough talking lawyer. He ain't going to be the type of person that's going to allow somebody to move the goalposts at the last minute. It appears that there's a gentleman called Nigel Howe who is the former chief executive of Reading Football Club, he was involved, in theory, with helping the sale of the club. But unfortunately, he was given a 12-month ban from football at that sort of start of the year. But that was just in respect of the first six months, was in purely to do with player transfers. But the second six months, he's not allowed to have any football involvement because he's been charged by the by the FA for illegal payments to agents. Who would ever thought that somebody would make it? You know, it's a. I think it's an old father Ted. It's just resting in somebody's account <laughs> type of scenario. That second six months has been reduced to three. But if he was involved in discussions, he can't get involved in those discussions anymore. We don't know what's happened to Die Younger. So it could be that Rob Kohig is, is there with, with with a pen and he says, I'm willing to sign, but I need somebody to sign the other part and there's nobody to talk to. So it's it's a shambles. And it's such a shame because we've got to know some of the Reading fan base. There's nothing better than getting your hopes up only to have them dashed again. Yeah. Well, South End fans will know how that feels. Mm. Wigan fans will know how that feels. Too many people know how that feels. Three stories, Kieran, from... Scotland, it's that the first one is via a detour along the south coast. <laughs> That's right. This is in respect of Heart of Midlodian. Mm. There are talks, apparently, with the Brighton owner, Tony Bloom, about him putting £10 million into the club. Yeah. Now, whether that's going to be in the loan or in the form of a loan, whether that's going to be in the form of offering the services of Star Lizard, which is his company, yeah. which is full of boffins, you know, PhD geniuses. Star Lizard charge Brighton £3 million a year for services. Now, we don't know what those services are. We suspect there's something to do with spotting a 15-year-old kid in Ecuador, who's doing right. keepy uppies like nobody else is doing keepy uh-huh. uppies, yeah. and and saying right, go get across there with a butterfly net and secure that person's services. <laughs> so, if it's to do with provision of services for Hearts and then having some sort of relationship with Brighton, that's intriguing. But my view is that Tony Bloom had to sell his interests in a Belgian football club because there was potential conflicts of interest, because both clubs ended up in in the same European competition. Could Hearts end up in the Europa Conference and Brighton end up in the Europa Conference at the same time? That's a possible as well. So it does seem a little bit strange if he's going to buy a proportion of the club. So trying to work out sort of the broader motivations behind it are difficult, or is it going to be one of those areas where you know, Brighton signed 27 players in a, in, the, in a summer, as they have a habit of doing at the present, and yet four or five of them go end up, end up at Hearts, and both clubs are going to have the same sports science, the, the same stretch strategies in terms of tactical and technical training and so on as, as part of this overall deal. It's not gone through yet. I've spoken to some people in Scotland today, and they're intrigued by it. There is a belief that finishing third in Scottish football does give you potential access to European games and allows players to develop there. So if Hearts could become 
the third team. And there's a lot of teams trying to be the third team in Scottish football at present. That could actually turn out to be quite lucrative if you, if you do it regularly. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kieran, but it's not that long ago since Brighton had a deal with Hibs, a kind of talent swap player development deal, didn't they? Yeah, I think that's uh, that that sort of expired. And okay, right. I think Bournemouth now have that relationship oh, okay. because the the Bournemouth owner has has a has a, a some sort of agreement now with Hibs. Okay. Now, if we've got three stories about Scottish football, one of them is going to be about Celtic and Rangers. So, drum roll, please. It's Rangers. It is Rangers, and it is sad news. John Bennett, who's who's the the chair at Rangers. He's he's announced his retirement. Now, we've had John on the show. I've had off-record conversations with John on, on a few occasions, and I've, I've always been treated very kindly by, by people on the Rangers board, which, you know, let's be honest, given my name, is, is something you wouldn't yeah, yeah. necessarily expect to be the case, but they, I've always gone extremely well with them. It's a very stressful job. And uh, for health reasons, John Bennett has decided to resign. He has lent the club a large sum of money. He's been successful in his own right. My understanding is that that money is going to remain as a loan to the club. So I, I, whatever's happened, you know, health is far more important than football. You know, and we yeah. must always remember this. He was very blunt and, and very bleak over the course of the summer in relation to Rangers' performances on the pitch and the financial challenges that the club faced. I don't think that necessarily went down well with the fan base. Sometimes we all don't want to hear bad news. Yeah, yeah, fair. Uh, and Rangers have had a, a modest start to this season. So he's, he's announced that uh, he's, he's going to resign. And all I can say on a personal level is, is all the best and, and look after yourself, John. Well, and the opposite of bad news, Kieran, Dundee United fans have had, well, the, the greatest of news this week, Kieran, what? There must be a real spring in the step of Dundee United fans with the opportunity they've been given this week. But that's right. You know, it, it's coming to the end of the summer. And, you know, like, like many people, I have spent an inordinate amount of time, not as much time as the Baroness, I'm not, I'm not a particularly green-fingered person, but uh, yeah, mowing the lawn. And, and at least you won't have to do that over the course of the winter. Well, the great news for Dundee United fans is that they have the opportunity to buy a piece of the Tanner Dice turf for only £29.99 a year. And I think they get a square foot of turf. I'm not quite sure the exact dimensions anywhere on the pitch. And they will never have to mow it because it is a digital piece of <laughs> turf. What Dundee United have done, remember the old sort of spot the ball competition where I you do. put little X's? But what they've done is they've effectively put an enormous grid on the Tanner Dice pitch virtually, and you can buy for £29.99 a year or £49.99 for three years. And people in Scotland, they, they, they like a canny bargain. Yeah, that's a deal, yeah. That is a deal. They can now buy their very own square foot of non-existent turf, and they will get a certificate to that effect. This does take me back. There was a fad, wasn't there, probably about 15, 20 years ago, that you could have a comet or a star. Yeah, or after crater you. on the moon. That, oh, yeah. yeah. You normally find, found these in, in the Sunday people, the news of the world towards the back pages. You go, oh, wow, that'd be really, that's a really good Christmas present because I can't think of anything to get somebody. And you paid the equivalent of £29.99 and you've got a piece of paper which says, I own, and I think they're going to do this on a, on a latitude and, and a longitude basis. This is what you've owned. And I think Falkirk are going to follow them or have already oh, followed really? them. So is this a way forwards? I suspect that sales might be slow. It's also, it, it is very much like one of the, you know, my mother-in-law's Daily Mail where you can buy a, a John F. Kennedy golden half dollar or a quarter of a Princess Diana plate. But this is one of those where I... You couldn't resist. If somebody said, here you go, and they send you a little picture of a little square bit of turf, and you go, that's not the one I asked for. <laughs> that's, a, that's a completely different half, that bit of grass. <laughs> what a world we live in, Kieran. Yes. What a world we live in. <laughs> we have two stories left, Kieran, and the first of those two is knowing what you feel about transparency. This story, Kieran, is 
it's the equivalent of soft porn for you, this story, Guy. When I, <laughs> I saw this, I saw this story and, and I thought, oh, Kieran's going to love this story. Kieran, there's a spreadsheet and this story will be up all night. This is a lovely story for Kieran. <laughs> yes. Okay. Hats off to FC Porto. They have created on the club website a transparency portal. And what they're going to do, they they divided this into seven sections, people, players, contracts, sustainability, contracts, documents, and infrastructure. And one of the things which we do have a bit of a moan about is we've signed that unwritten contract as, as fans. You've done it with Palace. You're, you're there until the day your heart stops beating. I'm the same with my club and so on. And that's the case for the vast majority of football fans of individual clubs. And in return, we don't ask for much. We don't even expect the teams to win all the time, but we, we do expect the clubs to be honest and transparent with us. Um, so this is a transparency portal. And fans, if they're interested, can go in and they can see sort of who are the sponsors and the length of the contracts, what the club is committed to in terms of infrastructure spend for the next few years and so on, various documents in, 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 and uh, bits and pieces, who does what at the club. Uh, and what I suspect will happen is that there will be an initial surge of interest from still relatively few members of the fan base. And then nobody will stop. You know, there's, although only the dweebs will look at it on, on a rare basis. But it's a nice thing to do. It is the fans' club. You know, we, we've, we, we're not being overly romantic. Without football fans, the game doesn't exist. So, so why not let the fans see exactly what's happening? I think just as important is that uh, Porto have an ethics committee. That's nothing to do with Ron Martin uh, at South End. <laughs> no one's the best. And again, it's to show this. This is how we conduct ourselves from an ethical perspective. So. Fair play to Porto. It's a bit of a press releasey thing more than anything else, but it, it's it's a step in the right direction. And you started Portuguese lessons at evening school, Kieran, I know. <laughs> That's right. Now, our, our last story, Kieran, now, our listeners will be thinking to themselves, oh, I don't think there could be happier fans than Dundee United fans this week from what we've I don't think there's any club's fans this week are being offered an opportunity as exciting as Dundee is, but they'd be wrong, Kieran. They would be. They wrong. would be wrong because Sheffield Wednesday fans. Oh my lord! What a, what an opportunity this is for Sheffield Wednesday fans. That's right. Most clubs have just announced their kits for twenty four twenty five, and we've been through our Trini and Susanna <laughs> thirty minutes with our mates <laughs> down the pub, saying, "Oh, you know, not sure about you know collars, cuffs, always slightly different shade of oh, you know, how's that going to look on me?" And some fans will all be saying, "Well, that's." I've, I've now got 11 months to wait until next year's kit comes out. Well, Dejon Chansiri, the, the, the guru of Sheffield Wednesday, has answered prayers because for a mere £69, because you can buy next year's third kit at this year's prices, if you pay your money now, you can get next year's third kit. Don't know what it's going to be. They haven't designed it yet. They've not designed it yet. But they're, they're, it's in the middle of design. But this, Kevin, this I can guarantee you, it's it's got an owl on it. Yeah, it'll have an owl on it. So it doesn't matter what the colour is, it's got an owl on it. Yeah, and it'll, it'll be some kind of mint green, I reckon. That's what it'll be. But I mean, he, I mean, what financial benefit for the club does this have, Kieran, on a serious note? On, working on the basis that all but a few diehards are going to review, refuse to to take this offer up, presumably. Because you're, what you're doing is buying it. You're essentially putting your name on a list, aren't you, to buy next year's kit by paying your money now. That's right. From a cash flow point of view, and it does make you wonder how many Wednesday fans will buy into this, reading the club website what was intriguing. It said, this year's third kit sold out on the day that it was announced. Did it? And leaving some fans unhappy. <laughs> they, they haven't managed to get that. And I'm going, well, that means you didn't order enough. Exactly. Yeah. So Run off a few what more. you're saying, because you didn't order enough this year, we're going to give people the first refusal on next year's third kit and you don't know what colour it's going to be. You know, £69 is still an awful lot of money for, it is. Uh, for something which costs a tenner to make. Well, Also, as well, Kurt, I presume they must have a confidence that they'll have the same sponsor next year. They must have signed a deal 
Because that would be awkward as well, wouldn't it, if it's got a different sponsor on it? I don't think that Sheffield Wednesday have a front of shirt sponsor. Oh, I know okay. that they've got a, a right. back of shirt sponsor. Oh, okay. But I don't think they, they've got a front one. Right, okay. Well, that explains that. Thank you to everyone who's donated to the pod via our Patreon page. If you'd like to make a small monthly contribution to the pod as well, that'd be very kind of you. It will get you access to our chat community and our regular quizzes. And you can do all that by going to patreon.com slash price of football. If you have a question you'd like answered on the show, email us at questions at priceoffootball.com. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter X and find us on our YouTube channel. And if you'd like to buy our book, which is coming out in just a few days' time in paperback, you can find details on our website, priceoffootball.com. We'll be back on Tuesday, by which time hopefully I'll have stopped yawning. I apologise for the last 10 minutes. And in the meantime, I shall hand you over to Mr. Kieran Maguire for his customary farewell. Thank you, as always, to everybody for getting in contact, for correcting me when I get things <laughs> wrong technically, and I, and I fully admit that I do. Just a reminder that we are appearing live in Balham in South West London, South East London? South London, straight down the middle. S- South London. South, South London. London, yeah. On Thursday, the 17th of October, and we're really looking forward to that. We are also doing a benefit gig. We've not quite finalised yet, but we're going to be doing a benefit gig for a fantastic cause, the Samaritans, who are, are helping people in their worst moments of all. We're passionately keen on on issues of this nature. There's a variety of ways that you can support the show. Everybody that's supporting us via Patreon, thank you so much. It it is very kind. You can get the ad-free version. Um, But you could also give us a review. It helps us in in terms of algorithms, which are so important these days in, in terms of highlighting activities. By all accounts, it doesn't matter what you say on the review you could even say you would rather have the show presented by kevin day and titus oates <laughs> the antarctic explorer both of whom have been heard to say i'm going out for a walk i may be gone <laughs> for some time yeah was it titus oates yeah it was his, his nickname was titus his, exactly. no, oh, okay. yeah, his name okay. was lawrence but his, his nickname oh, okay. was titus That's how interesting i wonder let's not go into that <laughs> yeah I'd, I'd, I'd quite like that one kieran i like it when it's just me and you i like that <laughs> bye everybody bye I'm for the ball.